Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, you're from all over the place today, so we really appreciate you all being here. Uh, I'm Janice Kaminer Resnick, and I welcome you on behalf of members of our leadership team, who, which is for who are former Congressman Mel Levine and former Los Angeles County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky. Thank you and welcome to tonight's very exciting guests, the Bulwark Sarah Longwell and the Hopium Chronicle Simon Rosenberg. They are two terrific spokespeople and analysts, and we had them on the show a number of months ago, and we're very excited that you're back tonight. Thank you. And of course, thanks and welcome also to our wonderful moderator, Larry Mantle. Next week, we have two programs. On Monday, we have what will likely be our last Israel in Crisis program until after the presidential election. We'll be joined by two senior fellows of the Washington Institute, Dana Stroll and Michael Singh. Dana served under President Biden as the uh, Pentagon's top civilian official with responsibility for the Middle East. And Michael Singh was the senior director for Middle East Affairs in, the, in President George W. Bush's White House. It'll be a great program, uh, moderated by uh, Warren Olney. Then on Wednesday uh, of next week, join us for an election 2024 program with the dynamic duo of Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, and his wife and wonderful journalist Suna, Susan Glasser, of the New Yorker. That'll be another terrific program. Now to introduce and engage our guests tonight, please welcome Larry Mantle. Larry is host of the longest running talk radio program in, Cal in Southern California, an LA icon and an LA legend, and I think far beyond LA. Larry Mantle, it's your program now. Thank you, Janice. I so appreciate the kind words. They mean a lot. And it's always an honor to be with the terrific viewers of America at a crossroads this series that for the past several years has brought so many great guests, important analysis, and really touched on the most critical issues that we're facing and answering some of the most important questions that we're asking as well. You know, it was just about nine months ago that Sarah and Simon were in conversation with me on America to Crossroads. And I went back and listened to that program just to remind myself what we talked about and everything has changed in the nine months since not just the fact, of course, that we were in a primary season then. And now, of course, we're rapidly approaching the general election. But of course, the presidential race itself is fundamentally different as Vice President Harris, of course, is facing former President Trump. Uh, things have changed dramatically. We, we have much to talk about, and your questions are absolutely essential to the conversation. I marvel at the quality of the questions that we get. Uh, so please, uh, if you have questions at all about the election, things that you haven't really heard taken up elsewhere that are important to have asked, please put them in the Q&A. And I'd also ask, as we heard from the tremendous range of where people are watching from over the course of, of this evening uh, or, or even around the world tomorrow morning, um, please share where you're from as well as your first name with the question. It's just great to get a sense of where the question is coming from in addition to the name. Well, let me introduce our, our guests, uh, Sarah Longwell, uh, he, her news and opinion website, The Bulwark, offers conservative but anti-Trump perspectives. She's been a prominent voice in the Never Trump movement and operates the D.C. communications firm Longwell Partners. She also heads the organization Republicans for the Rule of Law. Simon Rosenberg is a longtime political analyst, strategist, and commentator. He founded the New Democrat Network, uh, later NDN, in 1996, from which the New Policy and Institute arose. It's a liberal think tank and advocacy group. And Simon writes the popular blog, Hopium Chronicles on Substack. Uh, great to be with you both again. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah and Simon. Simon, let me start with you. Let's start with the announcement today that for the first time in three decades, the Teamsters won't endorse for president. Given the gender divide in the electorate, maybe that's not so surprising given that the Teamsters is dominantly male in its membership, but to what extent do you think uh, this potentially hurts Vice President Harris? Simon? Yeah, so just to take a step back for a second, we just also have to acknowledge that, and Sarah and I will get into this, that the polling over the last week and the general vibes have been unbelievably positive for the Vice President. She clearly won the debate. Donald Trump clearly lost the debate and the election has changed and things are much more favorable to us now than they were. So I don't want to start just with a negative. I want to just get out there and say we should be very encouraged by what we've seen. 
Um, but on this issue, um, we have to recognize that even without the national team's support, the vice president uh, and her campaign has more enthusiastic labor support than any Democratic campaign in generations. And we saw today that many of the Teamster local unions endorsed the campaign. The national may be sitting it out, but in the battlegrounds, in virtually every battleground, and we'll see what happens over the next few days, the local Teamster unions endorsed the campaign. So the reality is that the issue of union support, she has more than any Democrat has had in modern American history. And so this is a strength and not a weakness as we head into the general. She has more so because Democrats, of course, in recent years have enjoyed uh, pretty overwhelming support from unions, the, the, but she has even more so. The unions are spending more money and more engaged than they've ever been because the Biden-Harris administration has been the most pro-union uh, administration in, in modern history. And so the level of union support as somebody who's worked in these battleground states, you know, we would sometimes get endorsed by unions, but they wouldn't necessarily be working all that hard. This is very different. And we have more and we have more union and more ambitious union support, more money being spent, more on the ground support than we've had at any time in the modern era of, of democratic politics. Uh, Sarah, your thoughts on on the Teamster decision today? Yeah, I don't think I can give as positive uh, sort of a spin on it as Simon is just because uh, I think it's the first time the Teamsters specifically have withheld an endorsement from the Democrats since like 1998 when it was Dukakis. And so, you know, Trump's kind of out there trumpeting the fact that uh, this non-endorsement speaks well. And I do think it's worth at least noting just for sort of as part of a realistic uh, political assessment of what the parties are doing, that the Republican Party has is really trying to do better with unions. Donald Trump is actively trying to build a relationship uh, with these unions. And the fact is, the reason the Teamsters didn't endorse is because I can't remember exactly how lopsided it was, but they had an internal vote with their members, and it was incredibly lopsidedly pro-Trump. Now, there's always been a bit of a disconnect among labor unions where many of their rank and file are more conservative uh, or at least culturally conservative. Uh, they tend to be these white working class voters uh, who Trump does very well with. And so um, I think it's indicative of that. That's why it happened. I don't think it's a catastrophic thing, though. I think Simon is right about the fact that, um, you know, in terms of the general democratic coalition uh which includes unions but is obviously way way bigger than that uh I, you know it, i would take i would take losing or not getting the teamsters endorsement for the amount of enthusiasm that kamala harris has currently than i would getting the teamsters endorsement and having because Biden probably would have, you know, they endorsed Biden. They I think a lot of it just is like Biden's an old school labor guy um, and they could sort of make the case to their members. Kamala is so new, you know, uh, but I would I would rather be in this position where they have the enthusiasm that they have from the rest of the coalition and lose this than the other way around. What yeah. I also want to since we're talking about you know, what happened today, we also got the half point rate cut from the Fed. Uh, as a result of of the cooling of inflation, the job market cooling as well. So, Simon, you know, what are your thoughts about yeah. on the economic issues, which are front and center for for voters? Is this helpful to Harris? Yeah, and just one other point on the union stuff is that you know the vice presidential candidate Tim Walls was a union member for many many years, <laughs> and so we actually have a longtime union member on the ticket, and so it's a, a sign just of the centrality of labor unions to this ticket in this election. Yeah, look, obviously it's very good news today for the American people, for the American economy. We've gotten to the other side of inflation. I mean, so much more is possible now, I think, for the American people and our economy. And I do think that we it will create a new opening for us to try to tell a better story about the economy in the coming months. The good news is that Kamala Harris, as her approval rating has gone up and the general view of her has gone up, you know, we did have that Financial Times poll this week that showed her three points ahead of Trump on the economy and who would be better to manage the economy. So she's in a very different, she's not as far in a ditch on economic issues as, as Biden was. Um, and so we're in a better place, but I think this is gonna create an opening for us to improve our standing on an issue that is, is obviously the central issue of the election. And I think that Kamala Harris has done, what I'll just say as a campaign guy, 
I love her framing of the economy around, I want people not just to get by, but get ahead. And her focus on opportunity and entrepreneurship. I think part of what happened to us during COVID was that we got on the other side of opportunity with too many voters, that the shutdown Democrat attacks on us actually, I think, lingered and hurt us. She's doing a great job, I think, at creating a very powerful frame in which she can speak to voters. And obviously, the campaign is spending an enormous amount of money bringing her very kind of human-based and this opportunity agenda to voters in the battleground states. They know how of important course, this is. You know, Simon, the flip side of that is who are the people you hear uh, complain most about democratic economic policies are entrepreneurs who claim that democratic policies constrain their ability to, to do business. They have to deal with a wide range of en environmental restrictions and, and all kinds of taxation policies that they complain about. So I understand she's talking about that she thinks there needs to be more entrepreneurship, but, you know, Sarah, maybe you can speak to that point, um, you know, because this is something Trump's not necessarily strong at, at making that as, as an argument in his campaign, but something that Harris certainly has to address. Yeah, look, I think uh, what Trump does is he says, we're going to cut taxes and we're going to deregulate. And for a lot of business owners, uh, especially larger business owners, that's pretty attractive, but also for small business owners, uh, right? And that's the thing about Trump that you hear when I do the focus groups, when I listen to voters, people sort of are still kind of hung up on like, well, he's a businessman, he understands the economy, and he gets kind of just these extra points uh, for that. That being said, the poll that that Simon notes with the Financial Times isn't the only indicator that she is dramatically closing the gap with Donald Trump on um, her ability to have people trust her on the economy. This Quinnipiac poll that came out today, yeah. uh, which is like startlingly good for her uh, in Pennsylvania, had her within a just a couple of points on the economy, a couple of points on immigration. I mean, these are issues that when you were looking at the head to heads with Biden, just the chasm in how people trusted uh, Trump on the economy versus Biden was almost unrecoverable, at, uh, you know, by sort of the point at which Biden was kind of looking to it was becoming clear that it was going to be tough for him to go the distance. She's done a tremendous amount of work to make people uh, be interested in her economic agenda. I think she's probably got to get a little more comfortable talking about the economy. Right now, she's a little, her platitudes are good, but they are still a little platitude-y. Now, I would say as somebody who's like a right-leaning independent centrist now, um, and listens to Trump talking about tariffs, 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 like she's saying build, build, build. Like she's not just saying um, you know, opportunity economy. Like she is talking about that. And she also talks about her middle-class background and voters like that. Um, but she is saying like, we need to build more housing. That's a concrete thing that a lot of people understand we've got to do. Um, and so I think she's doing a pretty good job and it would be better if she could just get more fluid and comfortable talking about well, a lot does of she different need more economic specific, indicators. Does she need more specific? Yeah, I think on some because... things. Because when you say, well, we need to build more housing, but like Californians, where you've got a Democratic supermajority knows there are all kinds of of uh, governmental impediments to building. I mean, do you have to address that and say, look, I'm a different Democrat. I have ideas to really get housing starts generated where other Dem you know Democratic leadership has failed in that? Yeah. I mean, look, I wish she would. I wish she'd be much more specific. And I think, she, I think look, I think talking about um, you know, where re uh, regulations are sort of choking off entrepreneurship, addressing that is good. Small business owners like that. Uh, and but that just I don't know. I don't know if Democrats can get there. She's gone pretty far. I, I got to say, I'm already a little pleasantly surprised by how much she has pivoted to the center. I don't think she's done the best job of explaining why, um, but I do think she's done a good job of being like she is trying very hard to shake off. San Francisco progressive, which is important because the swing voters that they don't like that, that like creates in their stomachs. Like they don't, they don't know what it means, but they know what it means. So what like, is her economic plan? Maybe Simon, you can explain that because I hear the rhetoric, but I don't really understand what her economic, how, how is she going to boost entrepreneurship? How is she going to increase housing starts? What, what are some of the specific policies yeah. that would do that? So First of all, um, the Biden-Harris track record has, economic track record has been very strong. So one of the ways you can understand 
who she is and what she's going to do is based on what the administration's done, which is that we've had the best economic recovery from COVID of any advanced economy in the world. We've managed inflation better than any other advanced economy in the world, inflation, which was a global phenomenon. Um, we've had more new businesses started during the Biden four years than any four year period in American history. We have the lowest uninsured rate. We've made massive historic investments in accelerating the energy transition, building infrastructure across the United States, building chips and closing the gap with China on the chip and the chip uh, battles. Um, so the performance of the American economy has been unbelievably strong. I mean, we've had the best job market since the 1960s. And we've seen continued strong GDP growth. And now that we're getting to the other side of inflation, which again was a global phenomenon, I do believe that her, she's going to have even greater opening to make her case. What she's The core thing she's talked about is about getting costs down, particularly around housing. I mean, we know from inflation, there's basic data on this, that the thing that's still driving inflation is housing. And there's never been a national strategy to deal with it. It was something that didn't get done in the Biden administration. And I think it's the most important part of her economic agenda. The second thing is she's made an enormous commitment to entrepreneurship and investment. And for people who start new businesses, you're going to get a $25,000 tax break in order to be able to start new businesses. I go back to this basic idea that there's been more entrepreneurship and more new businesses formed under Biden-Harris than any administration in history. And so this issue about there being right-wing entrepreneurs being angry at her Mark Cuban just came out, an important entrepreneur, and said this is the most pro-entrepreneur um, campaign that he's ever seen in his lifetime. She has the support of many founders and entrepreneurs throughout the country. Um, so I think this, you know, look, the Democratic track record on the economy over the last three administrations has been very strong. She's going to continue our basic approach, which is to invest in people, invest in the economy, to try to grow the economy, re increase wages, get the deficit down, strong stewardship of the economy as Joe Biden did, as Bill Clinton did, as Barack Obama did, in which the last three Republicans yeah, I, who've been I, in power have failed repeatedly when they've- I just have three, to say something. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but just yeah. uh, uh, the listeners that I hear from who complain about yeah. high gasoline prices, food costs that are high, housing costs that are high, utility rates that have skyrocketed. In yeah, California. that's not her thing. That's not that's, her thing, though. Right? Well, but, but these- but but people attribute this to Democratic policies, not to Republican policies. But Larry, they we're going to win. We're going to win California by thirty five points in this election, right? I mean, so I, I, understand, I understand you're getting people in, complaining. But Larry, I'm going to finish. I understand that you're getting people complaining, but as you know, gas prices have dropped precipitously over the last year and a half, right? They're much lower. We've seen lower gas prices, lower inflation, lower interest rates. We've seen border crossings lower than any time, you know, than under the Trump administration. Crime went up under Trump. It's way down under, under Harris. We've seen overdoses now. We've got data today that overdoses in the United States have dropped. I mean, I understand that your listeners believe certain things, but on the economic measures, things are far better for the American people today than they were when Trump is, was in office. And I think this is a central part of what we're going to be talking about in the why election in the next two months. Why do you think so many Americans don't perceive that and and believe that things were better under Trump economically, Sarah? Well, I'm not going to I don't agree. I think Simon, I mean, I don't I don't know. Si Simon is much more. Um, I don't know. Uh, he's trying to make the best case available, and I think that's good. Uh, I don't know that it always comports with reality. I mean, listening to voters all the time like the thing is is they know how much eggs cost and they know how much more expensive eggs are today than they were before it's because of inflation like the reason voters are mad is because and they have this weird amnesia like there is a there is it is reasonable to be very annoyed that when donald trump asked the question are you better off today than you were four years ago the answer is no Four years ago, we were in the midst of a pandemic that you mishandled, uh, and we flooded, you know, we we gave out tons and tons of checks during that. Uh, the economy was shut down. Uh, people do tend to blame Democrats for that, and that led us to a big inflationary period. Um, and so, like, uh, I think that there is, people think about the pre-pandemic Trump economy with a lot of rose-colored glasses. And when you say gas prices are down or... Like relative to what? I mean, are they are they where they were in 2017, 2018 when people felt really, really good about the economy? So I think that's what you're hearing. And and the thing is, is that the macroeconomic outlook is different from how especially people who live paycheck to paycheck are experiencing the economy and uh, their paychecks haven't kept up 
with inflation. And so that's, that's not true, what, by the way. That's not true. But, I mean, that's just not true but, economically. Simon, hold on. Just hold on a second. The reason the reason that Democrats were doing so badly on the economy is I'm I'm sorry, but it's because they did this. They tried to tell people that they weren't feeling the economy as they were experiencing it. They were trying to tell them about the macro economy and not addressing it. And actually, the reason that Kamala is doing better, because Biden was so defensive about his economic record that he wanted to fight over all of these like indices and and stats. What Kamala is doing, and I think is exactly right, is she's mostly being like Bidenomics. You guys, when we when we branded it Bidenomics, you guys were really hating the economy. And that was bad for Biden. And Kamala Harris is making a clean break and looking forward and just is saying middle class a lot. She's saying build a lot. She's right. saying, you know, entrepreneur and small business a lot. And I think that's good. I don't know that it could be mistaken for like a real uh, in-depth plan. But part of the reason that they don't feel like they need a, you know, thousand page economic plan is because that's not what like the the country has gotten used to Donald Trump, who's never put forward a significant plan. And so they feel like if we stay in kind of this lane uh, yep. more platitudinally, uh, as opposed to putting out a lot of specific things that they can shoot at, like we stay here uh, in this lane, like that'll get us somewhere. And like the honest answer is it is kind of working. Let, and let's yeah. let's shift because we're limited on time. I, I want to talk about, uh, and I think, I, I can't recall, Simon, you may have mentioned this nine months ago, I believe it was you, who said that at that point, because Biden, of course, was the, the, the presumptive nominee, that the progressive um, workforce essentially needs to be mobilized. The question is, are they going to turn out for the Democratic Party? So obviously, there's the excitement around Vice President Harris. It's a totally different tenor now, nine months later. So are there specific things she needs to do to make sure that the progressive boots on the ground for the party are there doing the work. Yeah, I mean, look, since Dobbs, we have seen one basic dynamic in our politics, which is that Democrats have continually overperformed expectations and polling and Republicans have continually underperformed them. And this has been a fairly consistent thing over the last two and a half years. And part of the reasons that Democrats have done so well is that we have this heightened democratic intensity in the democratic grassroots, and we also have lots more money than we've ever had. I mean, we had huge spending advantages over the Republicans in 2022, and the combination of all this additional money, which is an indicator of intensity, and two to three million people who've made a decision to spend enormous amounts of time working on campaigns, either texting, canvassing, phone banking, postcarding, all the ways that we help now, is that we have the biggest grassroots army that we've ever had as Democrats. And this has been deployed in election after election after election. And what we've seen in the last few weeks is that Harris is raising huge amounts of money, meaning that we're gonna have these very large campaigns on the ground. We've seen an explosion of volunteers come into our campaigns and not just her campaign, but all democratic campaigns. And I think what we're about to see is the strongest close of a presidential campaign in recent history, we have more tools to reach voters than we've ever had. And this expend, extended early vote window, which allows this grassroots army to work over a longer period of time than we used to be able to. So I think the party is incredibly unified. We know from polling, Gallup just recently released a poll that Democratic intensity right now is 14 points higher than Republicans. And it's as high as it was under Obama in 08. So the team that's about to go out and go conduct this, we have this early vote window that starts Friday, right? Early voting begins Friday in person, early in person voting. This 46, 47 days of voting, what we're about to be able to go do in terms of contacting voters, we've never been able to do before. They have a bigger grassroots army than we've ever had. And it's a central reason why I'm so optimistic about the election. And and Sarah, uh, you know, on, on the Republican side, it seems like Trump, uh, every few days does something to undermine his own case. Uh, I mean, one of the prime examples, of course, going back a few months, going to the Black Journalists Association and then questioning how the vice president has identified herself racially. But it just seems like there's just one thing after another. Now, that doesn't hurt him with his base, but are we seeing erosion with voters who might want to find a reason to vote for Trump, but he keeps taking that reason away? A little bit, although I actually think it's different than that. I think that uh, for the persuadable set of swing voters, more what I see is that they 
know why they don't like Trump. They're like pretty clear on that. And the question is, can they affirmatively get to a place where they like Harris? And so she has been uh, chipping away at that group. I'm watching movement all the time. I'm watching. I mean, the debate helped her enormously with these swing voters and these swing voters, right? They are right leaning independents, soft GOP voters uh, who voted for Biden, like we call them flippers. They voted for Trump in 16, Biden for 20, because they hated Trump. But now they they were, but they had also, we saw a ton of backsliding in those groups where these voters uh, with Biden, they were like, he's too old, which was the main thing. They mainly just thought he was too old, wasn't gonna be able to finish his term, but they were also mad about the economy. Um, I mean, I've just heard the complaints about the economy for years uh, as the number one driver of why people, I mean, I remember a guy, he sort of crystallized it when he said, I hate Trump, but you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to turn off the TV, I'm just going to close my ears, and I'm going to enjoy Trump's economy. And I think that there's a strong set of people who felt that way, where it was like, I know he brings chaos. I know the guy sucks. I just think he'd handle the economy better than what we're dealing with right now. Now, whether that's fair or unfair, I heard versions of that constantly from this set of voters. However, this set of voters, Kamala Harris is winning them over. Uh, we just did, after the debate, we did a group. Now, the only screen we had, it was, you know, Trump to Biden voters, and they had to have watched the debate. So they're a slightly higher, um, more engaged audience. She swept the floor. Like, she crushed. They all thought she crushed the debate, and then they were all, and they were all going to vote for her. Um, and we've seen that in the group subsequently, how much she has done to pick those people up. I think the question is, there's this other type of undecided voter. It's the most important, which is the person who's going to decide whether or not they're going to vote, right? It's not right. just somebody who's deciding between the two candidates. And I think she is also doing and has done, I mean, the speed and alacrity with which she reconstituted the Democratic coalition. And if you look, I'm not uh, I'm not like on the ground in Democratic spaces, but you talk to anybody uh, who's on the ground, they'll tell you they're volunteers. Uh, are just through the roof. Like they can't even accommodate all the people who want to come help. Everybody wants to do postcard writing, door knocking, like just the enthusiasm uh, is enormous. And I think that that is for an undecided, that bigger set of undecided voters, which is, will I decide to go out and vote at all? She has uh, like supercharged this race. Uh, let's let's talk a bit about the gender divide. Paul Maslin, the pollster in Politico, recently said this is close to the biggest gender gap that we've ever seen. The recent New York Times Siena College poll in swing states showed 55 percent of registered men going with Trump, 16 points higher than for women. Uh, polling of men under 40 shows Trump with with uh, strength there. Um, so this gender divide is it, Simon, is it anything that um, yeah. re, re, Democrats need to be concerned about? Well, for right now, it's working for us. Right? I mean, as Sarah was saying, I mean, not only do we have all these indicators of intensity, but just look at the polling in the last few days where we've had national polling and then state polling. The way I view this right now is that Harris is now basically where Biden was in 2020. I mean, she's about four points ahead in the national vote. When you look at all the states that were polled this week, she's the either at, and there are many, Maine, New Hampshire, you know, Massachusetts, Virginia, Iowa, we had lots of state polling even outside the battleground. You know, she's at or above Biden's 2020 numbers in many of these battleground states. And that's before this huge grassroots thing kicks in, you know, and also we have more money to put ads on the air, right? We have more capacity to move this race towards us in the next six, seven, eight weeks than than they do. And so we're in a very favorable position right now. There's no question that part of this energy that Sarah was describing, a lot of this is coming from women, right? Because Donald Trump has stripped the rights and freedoms away of women in the United States, and it, he is a proximate threat. And the truth is that as bad as things are for women today, and Kamala Harris is about to give a speech on this in Georgia in the next few days, that things are going to get worse for women in America if they win this election. And so a lot of the money and the passion and the volunteerism that we've seen are coming from women. We've seen a, we, the early data that we have on voter reg numbers show that you've seen a huge increase in women, younger women of color, which is an important part of our coalition, surging into the electorate and the registration numbers. And so, so far, this gap is working for us. So you don't really um, need men. I mean, what no, no, saying, no. But but I just, uh, just a final point is that I also think though that Tim Walls was also put on the ticket in part to address this. He's not only 
somebody who's, you know, served in the military and was a football coach and, you know, but he also comes from a small town and, and small town, you know, rural America. And I think that Kamala Harris saw him as an ambassador to parts of her coalition that may have been hard for her to reach. And I think he was a very savvy pick in that regard and right. speaking directly to the question that you were raising. Yeah, uh, Sarah, your, your thoughts about whether the gender divide is significant in the outcome ultimately. It is significant and it's gonna be, like my big concern about the gender divide is that it's gonna become sort of the dominant polarizing um, metric going forward that women are increasingly pro progressive uh, and that I'm actually like concerned about what it means for the species, like what it means for <laughs> Americans, like men and women being able to marry each other and procreate. And, and that's a whole but, other a program mm -hmm. that yeah, definitely worth worth doing. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, but I, I, the thing that's going on with men, and I think it has to be addressed, not just electorally, but the amount of we I would call it the manosphere. The manosphere is this sort of. Uh, it codes right wing, but it's not necessarily right wing, filled with influencers on TikTok and YouTube that talk to men about wellness, about dating, about how to be, you know, better at things. But it ranges all the way from like really gross, terrible people uh, like Andrew Tate to some of the sort of Daily Wire guys to the more like Dave Portnoy, Barstool Sports bros. Uh, Elon Musk is all part of this. There's kind of a tech bro sector of it. And part of that, there's a reason, like if you look at where Kamala Harris is doing poorly and Joe Biden was also doing poorly, is the slide, people people will say like slide with black men, or slide with Hispanics, slide with, like, it's just all men. Like the slide with, with black voters is black men. The slide with Hispanic voters is a little less pronounced than with black voters, but still it's a lot of it is Hispanic men uh, and it's white working class men that are driving uh, a big part of Trump's coalition and frankly, Trump's strategy. The reason he picked J.D. Vance and the reason that you hear all these weird, uh, you know, footage that comes out from J.D. Vance is because all Trump and J.D. Vance do is go on these manosphere dude kind of blah, um, uh, podcasts and uh, and YouTube shows and say things that aren't that great about women. Uh, and they are they are accelerating uh, this gender divide by essentially they are on purpose, I don't know if it's on purpose, but they are absolutely alienating women and making women hostile to the Trump campaign. Uh, but at the same time, like their strategy is to run up the numbers with dudes. That's what they want to do. But That's what, what J.D. Vance was brought on to do. What do you think of that strategy though, Sarah? Because then you're essentially giving up suburban women I think and it's you're insane. saying we're going to get enough dudes to come out and vote. Do you, I mean, is, yeah, the, is that going to work? You have to understand that that the way the Trump campaign thinks is they were like, look, they they already outperformed their numbers in 2016. And then in 2020, they found all these new voters, right? They are what their whole strategy is. Can we find low propensity voters, people who are otherwise not particularly engaged in politics? They're sort of orthogonal to politics. They like culture, music, whatever. We are going to supercharge those guys. Now, I think the question is, and this is the unknowable to me, central part of the campaign. Are there a lot more people than there were in 2020? Like, was there a reservoir of people that Trump didn't tap into that he's going to be able to tap into this time around uh, to drive up those numbers? I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that. And I don't think anybody knows. And because like, look, if I were them, and I think a lot of Trump's, like the people who picked J.D. Vance was like Don Jr. and Tucker Carlson. That's who agitated for him. Susie Wiles and other people in the campaign were like, take Marco, take Nikki, take somebody that's going to appeal to these sort of center-right voters who don't love Trump uh, or and might appeal more to women. They just gave that up. They decided against going for, but the thing is, there are more women who vote than men. Yeah. And How is so that? Yeah, I yeah, and, uh, well, Simon, so two, I mean, how so, is that going to pay off? So two things about that that I think and why this bet was very risky for them strategically. One is that, um, you know, men are also married to women and have women in their lives. And the truth is that women in their lives have been the misogyny, the loss of freedom. You know, if you're a man, you know, there's somebody in your life whose life has been changed by these guys in a way that is bad. and And so... There's an enormous risk about whether or not people, men are just going to kind of overlook the fact that 
the women in their lives have had their rights and freedoms stripped away and that things are actually going to get much worse for them. But the second thing is that yesterday in this world of the manosphere, one of the most important members of that manosphere, Joe Rogan, did a long extended discussion talking about how great a job Kamala Harris had done in the debate. Um, he mocked Donald Trump repeatedly for being inept and not performing well. He talked how great the campaign, the, the Kamala Harris's campaign was. It was kind of shocking. I mean, I saw the clip. I actually was on another podcast where we discussed it at length today. And so one of the key, arguably the most influential of all those Manosphere guys is saying all sorts of positive things about Kamala Harris right now and all sorts of negative things about Trump. And it was a little shocking when you go back and look at the clip. So we'll see what happens. You know, some people also want to go with the winner, you know, and right now she looks like the winner in the election and he looks like the guy that's losing. So we'll see. But this is I agree with everything that Sarah said about, you know, I have two boys who are Gen Z guys who grew up in this manosphere stuff. And there is an entire incredible media ecosystem speaking to young men right now in ways that are pushing them further and further away from women and further and further away in many ways from sort of civil society, you know, more broadly. And I think the fact that during COVID, many of these young men were taken out of civil society for 18 months and they played video games and they lived their lives in these very right-wing video game cultures was probably not a great thing for this whole issue that we're discussing. I think the experiment of taking men out of civil society and taking them out of the, the of being around women for 18 months was probably in a very developmental and important part of their lives, probably not a great thing for the country. I wanna talk about the the six uh, states that are in play and, and the decisive states. Uh, Jennifer Rubin in the Washington Post just recently wrote about how you know North Carolina may be, uh, may even before we get to other states be decisive there. Um, and and um, I just wanna talk about how these other races in other states or measures that might be on the statewide ballot to drive vote, how you see them playing out. And Sarah, maybe you know one or two examples of something you think is going to be um, potentially decisive on the presidential race, aside from just Trump versus Harris. Yeah, I mean, look, obviously abortion is going to be one of the number one things. And in Arizona, there is uh, an abortion ballot initiative that I think can help uh, raise the salience of that issue in a state that is uh, tighter than one might think at the national level, even though Ruben Gallego, who is the Senate candidate there, looks to be kind of blowing out Carrie Lake, uh, the lunatic election denier who tries to pretend like she's a mini Trump. Um, but it's not translating as much to Harris. Uh, and Biden was way behind in Arizona. It's a border yeah. state. Immigration is very important there. Um, people, inflation hit Arizona slightly worse than other places in part because it used to be the kind of place that was like cheaper than Denver, cheaper than California. People would go there and housing prices have now gotten to the point where like people are priced out there too. And so there's a lot of frustration in the state. Um, but that, that abortion ballot measure might be, might be the saving grace that sort of puts Harris over the edge. For me, look, I understand why people are interested in North Carolina, because it's basically been a place Obama won it. Democrats haven't gotten it since. They think they can get close every single time. They also have a gubernatorial candidate in North Carolina who's just absolutely bonkers. Just this guy, Mark Robinson, totally nuts. Uh, he's going to get blown out likely um, by the Democrat uh, governor, the G Democrat gubernatorial candidate. Uh, uh, attorney there. General, yeah. That's right. Um, and Wait, who does what? What name did you say? Josh, 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 Josh Stein. Yeah, Josh. Josh Stein. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Stein. And uh, but I always I, and look. It has more black voters, which is why I think they think they can get North Carolina. The only thing that Kamala Harris should do, in my opinion, is go move to Pennsylvania and make sure she wins Pennsylvania. <laughs> Pennsylvania has 19 electoral votes. You have to have it. The Trump campaign was so happy when she didn't pick Josh Shapiro because they thought that made Pennsylvania much easier for them to win. I think that's probably a little bit true, although it might have caused some issues in other places. Uh, I still wish she'd pick Josh Shapiro, but 
<laughs> I do think that like Pennsylvania is the ball game. And I just, sometimes I have a very utilitarian sense of these things. Like the path is still Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nebraska too. Although keep an eye out for more shenanigans on Nebraska too. They are going to try to take that off the map. I think in a special session, uh, it would be great if she could pick up North Carolina. It'd be great if she could pick up Arizona. I think the fact that she's doing slightly better, but then, uh, than Biden was with Hispanics and black voters is helping her in Nevada. Um, what state am I missing right now? I'm missing Georgia, one more. Georgia, Georgia. Georgia. I think Georgia is going to be tough for her. Um, I do, even though it has more black voters. Again, she's underperforming with black voters relative to what Biden did in 2020. Uh, and you know, the Republicans there, they're mad too uh, at Democrats. I, I don't know. It's it's. A, I just I would really focus on those in, uh, industrial Midwest states, the blue wall. Yeah. So Simon, I'm interested in your analysis. I do want to get to viewer questions, so if you could uh, just yeah, hit some of the highlights in those states. Yeah, I think I think what Sarah was raising about the underperformance of Republicans underneath Trump in these battleground states is a significant issue. I mean, if if Josh Stein wins by ten points in North Carolina, if Ruben Gallego wins by ten points and in Arizona, if we have in, in the other states where there are really struggling Republican Senate candidates, this stuff's going to really matter because it's not only that they're struggling, but they're also generating negative noise in the in the close, right? There's just, it's hurting the Republican brand. Um, and so I think this has been one of the most undercovered stories, frankly, of the election is this, do we think that Trump is going to go down to them or they're going to catch up to Trump? And is there really going to be that many um, uh, ticket splitters. It's unusual to have that level of ticket splitting. It's just not common. It could happen. Anything can happen in the era, age of Trump, right? Um, but I think the strong, the underperformance there, I think also the um, the ballot initiatives, as Sarah mentioned, I think, are, you know, there's also one in Nevada and there's one in Montana, for example, could end up being this kind of a thing that helps Democrats close. And then let me just look at my other, my notes here is that I think the other thing that is still not being adequately factored in, right? Because if you look at the election purely through polling, as opposed to the way people in politics look at it, which is strength of candidate, strength of performance of the party, right? Volunteers and money. Our financial and volunteer advantage will probably be as great as any advantage as in the, you know, in recent times. And I think that that stuff is really going to matter in a major way that has not currently been sort of factored into the, the thinking. And I, and I think the, of, of where, and I think the interest rate cuts today were super helpful to the Democrat, you know, for the Democrats. I was surprised it was 50, that it was half a point. I think the conventional wisdom is they do a quarter. And so this was a huge help because this is going to have an immediate impact on people who have variable rate loans, you know, mortgages are going to go down immediately, right? So this is going to have a, an immediate impact on people's perception of what's happening on the stuff that Sarah was getting at earlier, which is now a new development. So, you know, I feel just generally that our capacity to close is much stronger than theirs. And that's without even sort of factoring in Kamala Harris who's performing at an extraordinary level as a candidate and Trump who's really struggling right now as a candidate. Uh, we have viewer Lana who asked, and, and she's not alone, others have asked this question. The two assassination attempts on Trump, uh, Sarah, any impact on that? Unusually, no. And I think part of the, it's funny, we've done focus groups with swing voters after each of them, we've asked about it. Voters are, are if they are going to vote for Trump and they don't really like him, they're doing it because of the economy or immigration. Like they really are just sort of holding their nose. But they the they bring up like how Trump treated Paul Pelosi when like there is no part of these voters that thinks, oh, boy, um, Trump's getting shot at. I feel really bad for him. That makes me want to go vote for him. That's just not the way it's working. There's not a rally around Trump effect on this. Obviously, they don't want there to be political violence um, and they make sure to say that. But there's not it is not helping him in a perceptible way with voters i think in part because voters do think yeah man like you are creating the specter of violence that everybody's living under and even if they might still vote for him but they don't necessarily use that as a like this makes me think he's a more honorable person we've had a number of viewers who've asked about um the um 
during the debate when Trump talked about Haitians in Springfield and and made the outrageous statement that he did. Um, does that have any effect on swing state voters, Simon? Look, I think this story continues, right? They're not letting up on it. And, and I, I think this is, a, I think the, as been written by many commentators, you know, their response after the debate has been wobbly, wild. You know, they tried to change the subject from the debate by sort of pumping this stuff up, which is, you know, first of all, J.D. Vance has just been lying, right? I mean, we now got reporting today that his camp, his one of his staffers called the city and asked them whether any of these reports were true, and they said no. And he continued to pump the lie even after he, they were informed by the city itself. I think at the end of the day, this is going to be this is one of those things to Sarah's way that she was describing this that sort of plays well in a very narrow part of the Republican electorate. But it's also exposing them, I think, to being, uh, you know, ugly people. This is ugly stuff, right? And there's no way to sort of make this look happy anymore. They overcommitted on something and it's blowing up in their face. And I think it's reinforcing the ugliness of their of their ticket, in my view, but we'll see. I mean, it's what's going to be interesting is how it affects the Senate race. I mean, you do have this thing now where like the Republican mayor, remember, it's not just the Haitians that have been targeted, but every all the Republican voters that live in those areas that J.D. Vance also represents had hospitals closed. Schools were closed where Republicans went to, right? They just canceled the biggest city festival for the fall. The city is under siege, not just the Haitian part of the city, everybody who's there. And you've had a, a, somebody who represents the state unleashing hell on a bunch of his own citizens based on lies. And I, I just don't know how this ends up playing well for them over time. I just would be surprised. Yeah. I'm interested in Sarah's take. On yeah, that. Sarah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, I agree. This was uh, a, a big part of this was they thought any movement away from the conversation around the debate was good for them, right? Because this is the Springfield stuff is about immigration approximately. And so they feel like that's safer terrain. It's also the reason he said he hated Taylor Swift. These were like any port in the storm kind of uh, shifts in the conversation. I do think, and this is the thing about Republican psychology that I think often gets lost is when they started flying and busing migrants from the border and just like into other cities or to Martha's Vineyard. Remember Ron DeSantis did this, a big stunt. Texas governor did it. And we are all appalled by sort of the inhumanity of it. Uh, but Republican voters love it. I do think this story is a little different because the people who said the things originally, like the reporting coming out of it is wild. The woman who wanted to make one of the original claims that they stole her cat and filed a police report about it. She found her cat in the basement uh, like and she they, they went and interviewed her and she was apologizing to her Haitian neighbors. The other woman who put something on Facebook about it also ended up apologizing. There is no shred of evidence that this is happening and these communities are being terrorized by it. And so I think unlike the busing or the flying immigrants uh, to other places that were kind of an inhumane stunt that but did ultimately break their way. I'm not sure this one does in the long term because it's so gross and it's not just the Haitian immigrants, as Simon points out, uh, that are being impacted. Harry, uh, oh, no, just sorry. last thing is that there's not a long track record of, in, of immigration being an issue that Republicans close on successfully at the final month of an election, right? It's really more of a base conversation that may be a little bit different now because of some of the things Sarah was saying, but. In 2018, Trump spent the last month of the election talking about caravans and immigration, and we won that election by eight and a half points. And so there's a long history of this being a very successful issue for Republicans in primaries and in among the primary electorate, and it not performing well for them when it goes out into the general electorate, because people do care about things like the economy and healthcare and the daily stuff a little bit more. It's not that they don't care, but there's just things that they all, they care about a little bit more. My and, that, impression, and that's though, why, yeah, and that's why I think this was also risky for them. My impression, though, Simon, was that in the past four years, immigration has across the board risen as a as a priority. Is that not the case? I mean, we have to be very careful, and it's something Sarah alluded to earlier that recognizing that the Democratic voters and Republican voters live in completely different information ecosystems. And so, for example, I just did a poll. I was involved in a poll in North Carolina that hasn't been 
publicly released, where on the question of are is things better in North Carolina, are things better in North Carolina than they were two years ago, a plurality said no, but among Democratic voters, which is 85% of our coalition, a very, by a significant margin, they said yes. When Democratic voters said their own economic you know, standing was far better than it was, right, when we asked these questions. And Republican voters, right, on the question of is, are things better in North Carolina, it was like 5% yes and 60% no, right? So like the gap between the understanding, and this is why it's not just lived experience. The issue of the economy, this is not about lived experience. This is There's a political construct behind this. And there's been tons of data showing that Democrats are actually much happier with the economy, happy with Joe Biden's. It's independents and Republicans, right, which is where Sarah is living. But the reason I raise this yeah. is in our coalition, what's available to us, the broad coalition, not some of the narrow undecided swing voters that Sarah's talking to, immigration is a very low performing issue among the, okay. Demo the broad Democratic coalition. Yeah, Sarah, just real quickly, immigration, how significant will it be as a driver in the election? I think that immigration is the most underappreciated um weakest spot for Democrats that is going to persistently dog Democrats. I mean, one of the stats early that I heard Simon give about, uh, you know, border crossings are at their lowest level. They are because they finally shut down the border like, you know, 10 weeks ago. Uh, and 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 look, Donald Trump absolutely scuttled uh, the effort that they did, the bipartisan effort to and and but Kamala Harris has been going on offense on immigration because she yeah. knows that it matters. It I, I just I think that immigration matters a great deal. I I think that Simon's point about it as a closing issue is an interesting one because I'm I think that's there's some merit to that. But in it's not just a base Republican issue, and there's a reason people like John Fetterman. Um, I mean, immigration has become synonymous now with crime. It's become synonymous with fentanyl. Uh, and there is a lot of the grievance politics that dominates uh, the right is about sort of like who's getting what. And it is right. also, you know, there's it cuts against different communities. There's a reason that Donald Trump leans into this idea that immigrants are taking black jobs because he is specifically trying to pit those communities together because there are natural existing tensions actually between some of those communities. And so I just think Democrats need a plan on immigration. Um, they can't just do what Joe Biden did for the first three years of his presidency. We, we've had a number of viewers who've raised the issue of potential violence if Vice President Harris win, wins the election uh, or efforts to undermine the result with Republican legislatures and the like. Sarah, let me start with you on that. Um, is this something you fear? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think political violence has been reinjected into um, this. I don't know this particular moment ever since January sixth uh, and the Black Lives Matter protests. Like people forget sort of how close to each other those things happened, and so how uh, for such a long period of time people were watching images. Now they're completely different. Uh, they shouldn't be equated, but in the minds of American voters, like things are hot 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 and we now have just a lot of new militia activity the proud boy like all this stuff is out there um and donald trump is a hundred percent not going to accept the results of the election if he gets uh beaten he's just not and so um i think either way the specter of political violence is real and uh we should we should worry about it and not think like it can't happen on the other hand you know, do I worry about it? Absolutely. I would never not worry about it at this point. I also think um, it's not a foregone conclusion. I don't think we should live in a mindset of like, we will absolutely start shooting at each other any minute, because I don't think that's good for us either. Yeah, Simon. Yeah, quickly, um, you know, the most important thing, I, I think the thing that one of the reasons that Trump historically, I think, didn't like mail voting and early voting was that what's about to happen, we are going to have 46 days, we hope, of people of and the American people seeing an orderly election take place and where people will be voting. There won't be any issues. There's not cheating, right? Who knows what shenanigans may come up, but this very long period of early voting is actually a problem for those that want to cheat because there's going to be a sense in the American people that all of this worked properly over a long period of time. And second of all, if there's a very heavy early vote, which there's likely to be, particularly on our side, given the intensity we've been describing, you're also going to see, you know, we're going to know that Democrats have big leads in these early vote states like we did in 2022. 
we're going to, you know, and if we go ahead, if we're ahead in the polling, if we're ahead, you know, in the early vote, the ability for Trump to make the case that somehow all the stuff we're seeing, there's really something deep and awful behind it, right, gets much harder. And so it's why how the Democrats perform in the early vote is going to be a really important way of mitigating some of this and making it far okay. less likely they cheat. And that's why for any of the folks who are listening here today and or involved in organizations, pushing Democratic performance in the early vote is really important, not just to help us win, but to make it far less likely that something bad happens after the election, in my view. And there are Republicans watching as well, since this nonpartisan um, yeah. organization puts it on. But I, I uh, we have a number of, of viewers who've also asked about Congress. And Sarah, what do you think uh, of the likelihood of, of, of who has what majority in, in each house? I think the Democrats will have a very narrow majority in the House and they're going to lose the Senate. Um, Tester's going to lose that seat in Montana, I think. Um, and I just it's tough. And I think the Sherrod Brown, Ohio race, super tough. We just focus grouped Ohio and there are some Sherrod Trump voters. Um, and I think that's also the case. You know, I think like, I think Pennsylvania might will probably be OK on the Senate side. Um, I think Ruben Gallego is going to win. Uh, in Arizona, I think Tammy Baldwin's going to win in Wisconsin. Uh, but I think Tester, like some of these states, they've just it's it's like it's like when they turned on Heidi Heidkamp in North Carolina uh, or uh, back when Colorado was a more Republican state. And I'm blanking on the name of the guy who was the senator there. But like there are just these moments when a state tips over. It used to be I think it was in the 80s, a full almost half of the seats were the Senate seats were of a different party than the presidential who won it. Now there's like two. It's it's like uh, it's just not happening that way anymore. And so, um, yeah, I think the Dems can narrowly retake the House because of the map. But I think the Senate is just so brutal. Simon, I mean, what do you think? Slightly different take. <laughs> so first of all, I think we're pleased with. Simon how says we're going to win it. it no, yeah. win it all. No, no, I mean, no, no, I'm not. I think I think we're slight. I think we're, um, op, you know, we're pleased with how the underperformance of the Republican Senate candidates across the board, this could have been a very different map where they were in a far more competitive position in many, many more states and, and they aren't in many places. I think that we still believe that Sherrod is up a few points in Ohio and is running a really good race. What the, all the events of the last week are gonna do to Ohio, you know, all the, the uh, dogs and cats stuff, we don't know yet, um, but the party has been pretty optimistic about his holding in part because he's got a bad candidate running against him. And our view internally in the party is that the tester race is a toss up. And so we're not conceding that that's gone and we're still spending lots of money there. And it may be fool's gold, right? If Sarah's right, but I think that we're not conceding. And so we view the Senate as competitive and that we've All got right. hard work to do. I, I don't know that any of the stretch Senate races that are out there will become real for us. I mean, there's some that are just outside of our grasp potentially. And if we had spent a lot of money there earlier they may have been more competitive. And I agree that we're going to flip the house. We, we need to wrap up. I want to give each of you a chance to close and maybe share the thing that you you think is the, the sort of biggest outstanding question, uh, given where we are prior to the election. Uh, Sarah, what, you know, what's the, the biggest unresolved issue here? Well, we have a joke in our office where we always, uh, as we debate all the finer points of these things, at the end, we always go, it's going to come down to turnout. Uh, because it is both a cliche and also true. Um, and, and for me, it is that thing I was talking about earlier, which is, are there a bunch more of these low propensity working class voters that Trump is able to turn out? Um, if I were Trump and my success hinged on young men, especially like young men of color and other groups that both historically do not vote for me or do not vote. I would think that was a lousy position to be in. Um, and the other thing that I think is yeah, just it. would be my prediction is that, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these elections are decided by which way the independents break at the last minute. I do think they're going to break for Kamala Harris. Simon, quick closer from you with like 30 what, what, seconds. What, what what more could I add to that? Um, I, I agree with everything that Sarah said. I think that um, I still don't think we yet totally understand the impact of this grassroots army that we have because we've never had anything as big and strong as this before and whether 
this is really going to sort of move the needle in a way that we've not been able to with our own low propensity voters, right? I mean, we they've got a low propensity voter strategy, so do we, right? And uh, and so I think we have more tools to drive our turnout higher than we've ever had before. And the question is, will that actually manifest? Will it happen? I think it will, but we still don't know yet. We still don't know. I want to thank you both so much. Uh, Just terrific. I've learned a lot in this hour. I'm sure our viewers have too. Terrific questions from our viewers. Thank you both very much, Sarah and Simon. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you for joining us. And I want to encourage you to support these programs, the kinds of guests, the kinds of analysis that you hear. Please make your tax-deductible contribution to the nonpartisan nonprofit Jews United for Democracy.com. That's Jews United for Democracy. Dot, uh, I'm sorry, dot org. My apologies. It's a nonprofit. Jews United for Democracy dot org is the website to make your contribution. We have two programs for you next week, Monday at five Pacific, two different views of the Middle East, former senior advisor to the Biden White House, Dana Struhl, and the former senior advisor to the George Bush White House, Michael Singh, in conversation with Orrin Olney. Singh and Struhl are both senior fellows at the pro-Israel think tank, the Washington Institute. This is likely the final Israel in crisis program between now and Election Day. So make sure that you uh, tune in for that, that you join us Monday at 5 o'clock Pacific. Then Wednesday, one week from this evening, 5 o'clock, wife and husband duo, Susan Glasser of The New Yorker, Peter Baker, uh, chief White House correspondent for The New York Times. They'll be analyzing the election with Madeline Brand a week from tonight, 5 o'clock Pacific. From all of us at America at a Crossroads, Thank you for joining us. Have a very good evening.